Thank you very much for attending tonight. Our thanks to Viviana Marsana of Transil Pro, who will be providing simultaneous translation from English to Spanish. Thanks also to Gary Atkins of uh, Gary Atkins Sound Systems for the audio, and to TV Santa Barbara for videotaping the forum. TV Santa Barbara will also be live streaming the forum tonight via the League's Facebook page, and the video will be available later for viewing via the Santa Barbara League's YouTube site, clwvsb.org. All of you are welcome to join the League and to make a tax-deductible contribution to the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara Education Fund, which finances voter education programs such as tonight's. Three of the four candidates for third district supervisor are here with us this evening, Joan Hartman, Karen Jones, and Bruce Porter. A fourth candidate, Jessica Parfrey, has let us know that she cannot be here tonight. Here's how the forum will work. We use the traditional League of Women Voters process and ground rules, which all of the candidates have agreed to follow. To maintain civility and the issue-oriented nature of our forum, we do not allow candidates to make negative comments about other candidates' character or qualifications, but rather we ask them to address their own qualifications and vision for office and their views on issues facing the county and the third district. First, each candidate will make a brief opening statement of up to two minutes. Then I will ask them questions that have been prepared by the League, giving each candidate a maximum of one and a half minutes to answer. We will rotate the order of responses. Timers with the League will track the time remaining and hold up cards with one minute and 30 second warning signs and stop sign. During the first part of the forum, Audience members may write questions for the candidates on the index cards that we handed out as you arrived. They were all on the seats. Please keep your questions short and only cover one topic per, per card. Please write the topic at the top. At the end, each candidate will have an opportunity to make a closing statement of no more than two minutes. And we will go in the opposite order that we did for the opening statements. Let's get started. Ms. Hartman, will you start us off with your two-minute opening statement, please? Good, e good evening, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, many of you know me well, and some of you are just meeting me for the first time tonight. So a little about my background. My mother was a, a community hospital nurse. Uh, my father was a disabled Korean War veteran. He died, leaving her a widow at 36 with two young daughters to raise. And at that point, she took a more difficult job caring for children at the City of Hope. And that, for me, was quite a lesson, to experience something hard and then take on something even harder so that you learn and grow and have more to offer in service in your life. My calling has been public service. Uh, I worked uh, uh, as a college teacher. I worked as an attorney. I uh, focused largely on protecting our air, our water, our land, and our communities. I served seven years as a CASA volunteer for uh, neglected and abused children. I served three years as your planning commissioner, and now I've served three years and one month as your uh, supervisor representing the third district. When I began, the county was facing some really major issues. We had disasters on a scale we'd never seen before, serious budget and pension shortfalls, long-term drought, and an overflowing jail. Today, the county is in great, greatly improved condition. Our county budget is healthier than any time since the 2008 crash. And despite the disasters, we've fully restored our rainy day fund. Uh, we've adopted new initiatives to divert people from the jails, and our fire department is gearing up right now to do borderless dispatch that will make everybody safer with uh, emergency calls. We're creating a greener, more resilient energy system for our county. Our local economy is strong. Our agricultural industry and our tourist industry has rebounded. And uh, we've demonstrated that our board, with very diverse perspectives, can nonetheless work collaboratively. And we've really set the foundation to uh, move our county forward. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Hi, my name is Karen Jones, and I see some new faces out there too. The three of us all ran in 2016 for Doreen Farr's open seat, and so we find ourselves here again I'm going to share a little bit different part of my story. 
I relate to a lot of what Joan is saying. My father was also in the Korean War. He was injured, but he was not permanently disabled. My mother's family came here in the Great Depression, and uh, they had some pretty tough times, but they made it. My mother was the first native Californian born to her family. My father came from a single home. His father was a liquor runner and um, got in a lot of trouble, and so his mother was left to raise three children alone. My mother lost her father when she was 11, and my grandmother, like Joan's mother, uh, became a nurse when her husband died. He was a police officer on a burglary call, and he was killed with two other officers in Stanislaus County. His name is Glenn Winans, and he is the first person on the Stanislaus County um, Memorial for officers who died in the line of duty. So my parents were young, my mother was 17, and my father was 23 when they married. And they had three children. And it was pretty tough coming up. And my parents were really interesting people. They were smart, wonderful, terrible people. And they remind me a lot of me. <laughs> but they taught me some really important things in life. And probably the most important thing I learned from my parents is that I own my life. They taught me to be responsible. So I thank them for that. And I think I've done the same thing with my own three children that they all know how to take care of themselves. And I think that's the most wonderful gift a parent can give. Thank you. Mr. Porter. First of all, my thanks to the league. This is awesome that you all are doing this tonight. So I'm Bruce Porter. I've lived in the San Inez Valley for 19 years now. Before that, I was in the Army Corps of Engineers for 25 years. After graduating from West Point, a lot of different jobs. So for example, I was in construction and I built over 300 family housing units. I was in environmental jobs. I was personally responsible for the desert tortoise out in the Mojave Desert for several years. I did wildland firefighting, and I was engaged in combat in Desert Storm, uh, after which uh, my unit was responsible for putting out a lot of the big disastrous oil fires and oil spills. I had the ability to go to Stanford University for a couple of, uh, and get a couple of degrees. Uh, there I met my wife, and uh, we began our life together there. Um, we've had three kids, and that's one of the reasons we moved to the San Inez Valley, was, was so that we could finish raising them. So Corps of Engineers, 25 years, the motto is Essayons. That means let's do it, let's roll up our sleeves, and make good things happen. So I applied that motto as I volunteered to serve our community after I moved here on the Red Cross as we responded to disasters large and small. In fact, we used this building several times as an emergency shelter with Rotary as we literally built a local park with our own hands, the school board at the high school where we achieved a 99% graduation rate, and I'm currently on the county food bank where I see we have lots and lots and lots of opportunities to do good things everywhere around the county. I love living here, my family has loved being raised here, and I look forward to sharing with you all a, a, a lot of things that I hope we can do to make Santa Barbara County better. Thank you all. Since Ms. Hartman uh, started off the uh, opening statements, we'll start the first question with Ms. Jones. And the question deals with governance. What is the best way to provide local government to the third district, including the unincorporated portion of the district? What do you see as the role of the district supervisor in this process? Thank you for the question. I think local government is really the most important government in my life because it's the government uh, to which I have access to participate. And the local government is the one that has the most impact on our lives. Sometimes I hear, that's not just sometimes, all the time, no matter who's the president, half of the country is upset about it. It's like, oh, that tyrant, whether it's Clinton or Bush or Obama. And at some point in my life, I realized that I should be more worried about 3,000 tyrants one mile away than one tyrant 3,000 miles away. So I started getting involved in local government. I went to meetings, I tracked different uh, rules, laws, ordinances that were being passed, and I was involved as a spectator. In 2010, some uh, women that I did volunteer work at a uh, local thrift store with came to me and asked me to run to be the president of the thrift store, and that led to quite an adventure. 
And uh, anyway, we ended up forming our own thrift store. The old board wouldn't get out of the way, so I became the president of the Sandy Inez Opportunity Shop, and we continued to do really good things in the community. And that was my first time ever being elected to any office, and I can say it's made a huge difference in the lives of the people where I live, but also a huge difference in my life. Thank you. Mr. Porter. The third district's really interesting because it does have a, a number of cities in it to include part of the city of Goleta, uh, but also the city of Yulton, the city of Guadalupe, the city of Solvang. But there's a lot of unincorporated areas, but they're pretty distinct, like Tanglewood and Casmelia and Santa Inez. So if you're the supervisor, you're a little bit like the mayor of each one of those, or, uh, of those areas, of the unincorporated areas. So what I would hope to do is to find put together some sort of citizens advisory council or municipal advisory council for each one of those distinct areas. Uh, every one of those areas has their own set of issues, they have their own set of interests, and they all want to maintain the character of their own individual area, their own individual township, if you will. So I would like to, to understand what they think that character is, how they would like to maintain it, and as supervisors to help them do exactly that, how to help them thrive locally and how to maintain uh, their own community. Thank you, Ms. Hartman. Thank you. Trust in local government is really key. In our world today, trust in many institutions has really plummeted. Uh, not just Congress or uh, the federal government, but newspapers, the media, schools even. So 74% of people still trust in local government. So that is a sacred responsibility for people to maintain that trust. And, and as a county supervisor, uh, there are at least three C's that you're working with. One, constituent services. People have needs and you have to get them connected to the services that they uh, deserve and, and that they're asking. And sometimes you have to help them win their way through the bureaucracy. There's also the county work that comes every Tuesday, and you've got the budget and various policy issues. But the issue of communities is important because 70% of the people in the third district don't have a city government like you have in Goleta. So each community has different goals. Vandenberg Village, they wanted a park, so we're getting a park. Uh, they, they were worried about fire, so we got uh, over two point five million dollars for fire safety there. Uh, the people in Isla Vista wanted a community services district and I worked very hard to get that put into place. This gives us a partner. When you're dealing with people who are disorganized, uh, who do you listen to? Who represents that community? Uh, so when you have organizations, you can talk to them, partner with them, and that's really the best way and most satisfying thing about being a supervisor. Thank you. Our next question deals with climate change. What, if anything, should county government do regarding the climate crisis? Please be specific about actions you favor for utility system resiliency, disaster preparation, and carbon footprint reduction. And we'll start with Mr. Porter for this one. So I'll, I'll choose to work on one of those with, with only a minute and a half to go. Sure. Um, it, it's a big responsibility of county government is, is, is the, the bottom line. So let me give you an example of one thing that I think county government should do. Um, we all know we, we, we need to manage the transition from the legacy fossil fuel uh, uh, energy-based system to renewable energy. So as a county government, how do we foster that? And how do we make sure we don't slow it down or make it so expensive it never happens? So, I mean, we all know that the permitting and zoning uh, uh, changes that any time we want to do those are extremely expensive and take a long time. So why don't we do this as a county? Why don't we pre-zone every existing energy facility for future renewable use? So, for example, if you're a gas station, um, and, and you own that, you know that if you're going to move to be an electric charging station someday, it's going to cost you a fortune and take you a huge, huge amount of time. Well, let's pre-zone it, still make them clean it up, they got to clean up their mess, but make it really easy in the permitting and in the cost to, to, to make that change. We can do the same thing with oil fields and solar panels, for example. Just an idea on how to make sure 
We're helping to make it happen, and county government just doesn't get in the way. Thank you. Ms. Hartman. Thank you. This is my number one priority, transition to a low-carbon green economy. And I love Mr. Porter's idea, so much so that we've already done it. We have a strategic energy plan, and that plan looked throughout the county to where we can develop solar and wind resources. We have already pre-zoned, and we've taken the burden of the environmental analysis onto ourselves. Uh, so this strategic energy plan uh, has has led to Strauss Wind, which triples our solar, I'm sorry, our wind power, our renewable power. That was just approved by our county board last week. We have community choice energy that will be starting with 100% renewable electric energy starting in 21, 2021. Uh, we'll have it a year from today. We are working, we've transformed and uh, our county campus itself, you know, look inward first, be an example. Uh, our building solar battery storage here in Goleta, we have battery storage uh, for resilience because of the power shutoffs and because the peaker plant, we're at the end of different uh, power cords that are fraying. So we've done a great deal and we're doing more going forward. We uh, must make this transition because we know that Santa Barbara County, when I became a board member, we had bluff collapses from, from climate change. We had uh, a serious, the Thomas fires, the Whittier fire, the debris flows. Uh, climate change is here and we are already at the forefront in making this transition. Ms. Jones. I have a little different take. I think that climate change is real. I think it occurred before there were um, cars. And I think it's something that we need to be aware of. And I model responsible living um, in my life. I live in a 900 square foot house. I don't have a four story air conditioned building where I conduct business. So things that make sense, I like. And because I grew up on an oil lease, I'm not afraid of oil in the way that a lot of people are. I think it's brought us a wonderful standard of living. And I don't think oil should be outlawed. I think uh, we can call it uh, fossil fuels are part of the solution. And when I hear uh, talk about uh, dirty gas stations, I have a neighborhood gas station that is very clean. It's run by a father and son. And I imagine it'll be around longer than I will be. But I see a place for all different kinds of energy. I'm a director on the Santa Inez Airport Authority, so I am fortunate enough to see a lot of innovation in um, what they're doing with airplanes. And they have electric airplanes now, but they don't go great distance, and they um, have room for improvement, and the FAA needs to keep up with uh, changing the law to keep up with this. But uh, people that want to just get rid of fossil fuel now are not thinking realistically about uh, everything from flying to manufacturing to making batteries to transporting vehicles. So I would like to have a rational discussion where we all can talk about things without saying that's off the table. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question deals with cannabis. And the question for this will begin with Ms. Hartman. The county has established caps on cannabis cultivation, nurseries, and micro-businesses. Should the county adopt different restrictions on cannabis cultivation from the current cap of 1,575 acres countywide? The cannabis has been a very complex issue for the state and for the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we when we were first developing this ordinance, there was a sense on the board that much that we developed for cannabis could spill over to other agriculture. So that was an issue. Should we regulate odor? Should we say where, how much cannabis you can grow on, a, on your lot? Should we have setbacks? Should we have different restrictions for hoop houses? These were all questions that came up, and there was a sense if we do this for cannabis, what's going to happen for broccoli? broccoli or garlic or strawberries or even grapes. So we have discovered that we have some conflicts between traditional agriculture and cannabis. And part of the uh, effort to deal with this was to establish the cap. And I was the one that established the cap 
countywide uh, like the 186 acre cap that we have in Carpinteria. And that cap may have to be reduced some more. We have been having some of those discussions. But the real issue is how do we address the conflict between traditional agriculture and cannabis given the substances that are sprayed on traditional agriculture that spill over onto cannabis and the odor that can affect tasting rooms and possibly grape, uh, the wine quality of the grapes. So these are issues that we are dealing with, and if I had more time, I'd tell you how. Ms. Jones. Well, I am the only native Californian sitting here, and I think I've been around marijuana and marijuana growing more than these other two people. It's just a guess, and that's not a criticism of them. Some people would think that is a criticism of myself. But I will say that I have a lot more experience with it, and I think some of the problems could have been foreseen. Throughout the years, there has been a push to legalize marijuana, and there have been people with uh, petitions to sign, whether I was down at the beach in Ventura, wherever I was. And I would always tell these people, man, if we legalize it, the government's going to get in it, and it's really going to be terrible, because all they're interested in is revenue. And I was right. So... The first thing you have to recognize about marijuana is that it is not a, a traditional crop, and it is grown, it is agriculture, but it's vice. It's, um, it's like comparing a strip club to a place where people are dancing, a dance recital. Some things are vice, casinos, nudie bars, smoking marijuana. So the first thing that I think needed to happen was to recognize that and to not look at it as another way for the government to get more money to grow itself. So that was problem number one. And this is a subject I'm very comfortable talking about, and I think that my vote would be very informed if I'm elected supervisor. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Yeah, I'll, I'll be blunt. Our county botched the rollout of cannabis cultivation, and a senior county official uh, just a few weeks ago made a very specific point that he thought that the Board of Supervisors was making a whole lot of decisions very fast without having any data to inform them. Uh, and that's why we're way down the road already on cannabis cultivation um, and, and still trying to figure out how to deal with the communities that, they're being, that it's being grown next to, what to do about neighboring uh, um, uh, fields of avocados and grapes and other things. Um, a lot of other counties took their time, d read the data, looked at Colorado to see the experience, what happened there, and we didn't. We just plunged headlong into it, and we've been zigzagging all over the place, and we're hurting not only our own communities, like Buellton and Carpinteria, but we're also helping the, the, the cannabis farmers who want to do good things, uh, costing them a lot of money. I, I talked to one just this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, who had sunk $400,000 into preparing for his cannabis farm, and then the county changed the regulations, and would not allow him to do that anymore. Well, that's not good. That's not good governance. Thank you. Um, do you allow for rebuttals? Not at this point. Okay. Um, our next question is on emergency preparedness, and for this we'll begin with Ms. Jones. Emergency preparedness for fire and flood protection. What steps, if any, would you recommend be taken to improve emergency preparedness in the third district? I think that emergency preparedness comes under um, public safety, and I think that's the number one job of county government, to make sure we're safe. That matters most. Um, once again, um, speaking as somebody who serves on the airport authority board, it's something that I'm very aware of. <clears throat> Our airport is involved in different fires and emergencies, so we have our finger on the pulse, so to speak. In um, a recent action by um, county government, they were considering even putting the dispatch at our airport, and I thought that would have been wonderful, but I'm prejudiced. I like the Sandy Inez Valley, and I think it's wonderfully located for such things. I wasn't privy to the decision-making there. Um, another place in the county that I've looked at for most of my life is um, La Conchita, and people who live in the area have been worried about a mudslide there for at least my entire adult life, and that was a tragedy. I don't know that it could have been prevented, but it seemed like a very precarious place to be living based on previous mudslides. So I think if the government 
focuses on safety and is aware of the different places where that could be a problem, then maybe we could avoid some of these um, horrible catastrophes that happen, although they may be part of life in some instances. Mr. Porter. Yeah, building resilient communities is, is an extremely important part of, uh, of what government should be doing, but also the nonprofit sector and our schools. I had the, the, the deep honor of serving with the Red Cross where we did a lot of work in disaster preparedness, and I think that paid off a lot, especially over the last few years as we've had, uh, well, all the disasters that you all know about. In the Army, I, I did a lot of disaster response, a very different kind of thing, but we have to be ready to do that as well. Um, to be ready to go when something does, does happen because it's never at the time you expect and in the way that you expect. I, I do think the county made a mistake when it decided to pull apart the dispatch of fire and sheriff. I think that leaves a big gap in our, our ability to, to respond and prepare to disasters. And then we put both dispatch centers in the same disaster prone canyon. Um, Ms. Jones just talked about San Inez Airport being a maybe a great place for one of those dispatch centers. I agree with her. I think that'd be a great place. We should have separated those so they're not in the same danger areas. And that's something, if we're not too far down the road, I would push to do. Ms. Hartman. Thank you. Uh, there are many levels of being prepared. So let me start first with the county. Uh, all of our departments have to be ready for disaster. When we had the Montecito debris flows, it starts with the emergency people, but then it soon goes to public works people, clearing roads, all of that. It's accountants. You're, you have to get all the resources and account for those so you can be reimbursed. So those are the county departments uh, are all prepared and working with nonprofits. The fire department is pre-positioning resources when its uh, conditions call for that. Our fire department is working on a dispatch that would allow for a coordinated response so that we have the nearest fire and ambulance to any disaster rather than being uh, being sent by jurisdiction. Uh, the sheriff doesn't have that, and uh, the fire very much wants that. They believe that that's a much stronger way to respond to public safety. Community wildfire protection plans are the way communities are working to develop uh, vegetation management, hardening, how do we protect communities, not just uh, defensible space around homes. Uh, I serve on the Fire Safe Council. I'm the first board member to do that. We are now working with communities not only to develop community wildfire protection plans, but to work with communities on social resilience, not just CERT training where it's catch and release, but how do you catch and keep? How do you build a sense of responsibility for your community and your neighbors? Uh, our next question deals with campaign contributions. A new state law, AB 571, sets campaign contribution limits for state offices of $4,700 for local elected officials effective January 1, 2021. Counties may adopt different limits, either higher or lower, if local conditions require them. Do you support adopting different contribution limits for Santa Barbara County? Why or why not? I do. Um, Right now, we have no cap in this county. And uh, in the 26, uh, 2016 election, uh, both uh, Ms. Hartman and myself had to raise huge amounts of money uh, in order to campaign against each other. And to be honest, it's, it's too much, it's overbearing, and I do not think it's good for the community. So I would hardly support, I, I don't know if 4,700 is the right number, but I would definitely support some number like that uh, in order to make sure that that these um, campaigns don't truly spin out of control with the huge amount of dollars that can flow into them. Ms. Hartman. I'm willing to consider it, but as long as we have the Supreme Court case, Citizens United, that says money is speech, that means we'll have money coming from other sources. My opponent up here has created nonprofits, and he gets those funded by his donors, and, and nothing, there's no way to track please. that money. You said nothing on character, but this goes to the issue and your question. Uh, funding nonprofit organizations that can support voter suppression, uh, funding his own campaign with loans and we don't know who will pay those back. Uh, getting PACs 
uh, that, that simply you can't trace it. So if you open campaign finance to this dark money that you cannot trace, that isn't transparent, then that is a disservice to everyone. Ms. Jones. I welcome this question because I'm the only one sitting up here clean. The last campaign, almost a million dollars was spent. One of the candidates here had a burn rate that I was just like, man, if you want to see what's going to happen to your tax Ms. dollars. Jones, okay, well, to the issue. It's dangerous, but what is safe is transparency. And since I've been young, I always knew where people were getting their support. Joan, at the beginning of the campaign, held a public safety meeting. Ms. Jones, please. Okay, well, you let Joan talk about I, some stuff. So I will say that the local politicians held a safety meeting, and even though that wasn't a campaign event, it was in the newspaper, so that is a type of support. Citizens United, I agree with in the sense that I think it is speech. Doss Williams also agrees, which is interesting, but I don't believe that money is the answer here. I think that we have the internet now, and I think that citizens have the government that they deserve. So if you are against or offended by um, campaign spending, or let's say a candidate is in the financial services business and we don't know who their clients are, they could be getting millions of dollars that we won't even ever know about because they don't have to disclose it. I'm on Facebook. I'm Karen Jones. Go vote karenjones.com. I bought a little stack of postcards and some really lovely signs that are all over the valley, and now they're starting to appear up and down 101 uh, that aren't affiliated with CoLab or any, any group. But I'm getting my message out, and if I win, if you put me in the top two, it will be exciting because you will have voted against campaign That's spending. It. Thank okay. you. This is a question on land use. Should the county continue to regulate the use of private property in residential zones. How do you approach land use and neighborhood compatibility issues arising from the shared economy? For example, Uber, Airbnb, vacation rental by owner, and home businesses. And coming back around, we start this time with Ms. Hartman. Land use is how we address conflicts in using land. So we have zoning and we put residential areas, commercial business areas, uh, and, and this is to protect the value of your property and to give you some certainty over time that if you live in a residential area, you won't have a smelting factory going in next door. Uh, so I, zoning is extremely important to maintain property values and to maintain a sense of uh, certainty going forward. These can adjust over time and we have ways to do that. Uh, the, the issue, though, of um, short-term rentals is basically uh, a de facto rezoning of land to say that bed and breakfasts and hostels and that kind of use can go into residential areas. On the Planning Commission and on the board, this was one of the most controversial issues that I faced. Uh, what we ultimately did is say that where you do have already zoned areas like mixed use uh, and commercial, that is appropriate for short-term rentals. We did allow for homestays so that people who want to stay in their house and can oversee activities on their property can indeed uh, have guests come. But many people live in neighborhoods for a sense of stability, community, belonging. If, if that somebody will feed their cat, that they can look out for each other. And when you and transform that into commercial, that calling is time. compromised. Ms. Jones. I think that zoning is important in certain situations, as I mentioned with Vice earlier. We shouldn't have strip clubs in neighborhoods or marijuana shops next to schools. But aside from that, I think it's really interesting to read about Houston, which has very little planning and development and some very eclectic neighborhoods, and it's a lot more inexpensive to own a home there. We hear about uh, affordability and what the government can do to increase home affordability. Get out of the way. Let people use their private property as they see fit. And I paid attention to the short-term rental issue because I really uh, sympathize with people saying, oh, we're having these people come in and turn our neighborhood into a business district, and we're residential. But then I thought about it. If people are coming in and sleeping there and they're obeying parking laws, 
It's no different having a drunk, crazy par a party at somebody who's lived there 30 years um, if it's somebody who's just one night there. There are laws that apply to people in neighborhoods, irregardless if they're uh, a short-term rental or they're the person's home. So I come down on the side of, yes, you should be able to do the short-term rental. I think we should adapt and grow with this economy, and it allows people to... Um, be able to afford to live in this area. So I would not have taken the same stand as our current board of directors. I think that the rules are very complex, and I don't think that they were as simple as were explained. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Uh, I think in residential neighborhoods, we need to hold a pretty tight line on uh, uh, zoning and land use. Where I think we need to be more flexible, though, is our, our commercial areas and our uh, agricultural areas. Business is always changing, agriculture is always changing, uh, and especially, I'll speak for the St. Inez Valley, for example, um, agritourism is, is a big deal. Tourism is a big deal, but now we have opportunities for agritourism as well. But that doesn't exactly fit a lot of the current land use codes and kind of things we have going on. So I, I think we need to be prepared to be very flexible and think, um, think about the future and be considerate of new ideas and new innovations that are coming up uh, in those agricultural and industrial zones. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you all for your questions. Um, the sorting committee has selected six questions that deal with issues that were not brought up during the first part of the forum. So these are new surprise issues for you. Okay, the first one. How should the County Board of Supervisors address homelessness and mental illness? Well, <clears throat> addressing homelessness is really a, a, one of the state's top priorities. And we have 25% of the entire nation's homeless population here in California. The good news, however, is that in Santa Barbara County, our homeless point in time count indicates that we have a stable population over about the last five years, about 1,800 people. Housing is a fundamental right, I think, for people, and we need to care for those who don't have shelter. I, when I worked in the San Inez River helping uh, with the uh, program there, we saw that there are many, many different reasons that bring people. Uh, it can be abuse at home, it can be drugs, it can be mental health issues, it can be a whole range of things, and there's no single post-traumatic stress, there's no single way to deal with it. What we, um, what we do know is that if you bring focus, resources, and coordination, you can address the issue. What we've learned is that veterans from 2010 to 2020 nationwide, homelessness has declined by 50%. So that gives us hope. What we have in the county is uh, a, lot, a lot of more money now coming in from the state. We have uh, a lot of collaboration across departments, and we have a new revolutionary tool, the coordinated entry system, so that nurses and social workers and all the people who touch uh, those experiencing homelessness can pull that information together to better serve them. Thank you. Ms. Jones. As I mentioned, I lived in the Salvation Army for eight months. I was 15, pregnant. I had my oldest son there. And while I was living in the Salvation Army, one of the requirements was to go to school. I wanted to go to school, but I had to, and that was a good thing. I got my GED while living at the Salvation Army, and then I lived with a relative and went to Bakersfield Adult School, the only uh, adult education that offered a nursing license in the state of California in, as a psychiatric technician. So diagnosed with acute care, which was an emergency where we uh, had people coming in on 5150 that are homeless. I see them on State Street, and they're gravely disabled. So sometimes we hear about a right to a house. I think where the right is, is the right of the public to live safely. And this is a public safety issue for the homeless person and for the people who are living, doing business. And people who are unable to care for themselves are gravely disabled, or they present a danger to themselves or other people, and they are um, in, in need of a treatment bed. 
There are different kinds of homelessness. Joan mentioned the veteran, and there has been a targeted effort to triage homeless veterans and put them with services. And so that's really a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Truly a complex issue, and um, there are new, no two cases that are exactly alike. Um, I had the honor of participating in this year's point in time count, along with several members of my team, you know, where we actually go, it's kind of a technical word, term, but we go out and we try to count homeless individuals within a certain geographic boundary. And after having done it, I do worry that we probably undercounted despite our best efforts. So it's probably a little bit bigger than 1,800, but, but it's some finite number. So my thought is, in addition to these other things the county is putting into place, because we can identify individuals and now we have the ability to to begin to collect a little information about what they might need is assign a caseworker to every one of those individuals. So whether he or she moves around or the family moves around, that caseworker understands the, the long-term implications of what's going on with that person and can better marshal resources to help that person to, to move them on to the next step, to, to find um, solutions, whether it be housing, or medical care, or psychiatric care, or whatever it might be. Thank you. The next question. How can Santa Barbara County prepare for and deal with a future drought? Beginning with Ms. Jones. If you live in a responsible way, you'll know that droughts are part of the California cycle. So I have been living in a drought or in a drought recovery my whole life as a native Californian. So what I do is I use water responsibly and I can encourage other people to do the same. I've gotten a little bit smarter about water because I'm president of our community service board. Earlier, one of the participants said that uh, the supervisor is a mayor to these little unincorporated towns. No, we actually have community service districts and they are not under the control of the county and we like being unincorporated and running our own business. One of our, our districts is ID1 and they manage water and they've done so very responsibly in, in our area. So uh, as far as managing drought, I think the county can um, set a good example and they can use water wisely themselves. But there are a lot of laws regarding water that involve the state and so I really don't know how, how big of an additional role the county can play other than to just know that droughts are part of California and we are not in drought now, but we will be again. Thank you. Mr. Porter. It's interesting to see how the, the drought issue has fallen out of the headlines after it starts raining. And we haven't talked a lot about what to do about drought. At least we haven't heard about it in the, in the news. But I think there are some very specific things that we should be doing. We know that the best water to have stored for the future is groundwater. So we need to be finding more ways through our zoning and permitting processes as we build new things or as we reconstruct things to, to build catchment basins, to do whatever we can to restore our depleted uh, groundwater basins. The other thing, the, the, the big water facility around here is Lake Kachuma. How can we make sure that it has a larger capacity for water? It's already been raised once, the dam has, to store more water, and I think we need to do a study to see if we can raise it another two feet. That would be thousands of acre feet of additional storage. Now, if it doesn't rain, it doesn't matter because it doesn't fill up. But we do have rainy years, so we, we need to be looking at solutions like that. Thank you. Ms. Hartman. Uh, the, the first thing is we have to conserve, and much of our water is used in landscaping and in agriculture. That's 75, 80% of the water. So there are grants and there are many uh, programs to convert to xeriscaping and landscaping as well as to encourage uh, farming with, with more water-wise techniques. Uh, the second thing is stormwater capture. Uh, we have flood water and we uh, shunt water polluted out to the oceans as quickly as we can. Capturing that stormwater is absolutely critical because that's how we recharge the groundwater. And the groundwater is the better place to store because you don't lose to evaporation like you do in uh, Lake Kachuma. We have mapped the different stormwater areas throughout the county. We have grants and we're um, figuring out how to uh, 
how to uh, create acre, acre blocks as recharge, groundwater recharge zones. The other thing is wastewater. Wastewater is a resource. Uh, you can uh, clean wastewater to drinking potable water, uh, either directly or indirectly by putting it into the groundwater. That uses one half the energy that desal does. Desal is a last resort, but it is very high energy use, so uh, that is, again, the last resort. Thank you. The next question will begin with Mr. Porter. And it is, in the past two months, Isla Vista has experienced two cliff collapses, resulting in falling student balconies. As supervisor, what will you do to reduce coastal erosion in Isla Vista? And I would assume this would also include other parts of the Santa Barbara County coastline. Uh, clearly, Isla Vista is the part of the county that's uh, uh, experiencing the most dangerous um, erosion of the bluffs. There are some very specific things that, that the county really isn't doing right now. The county just uh, making people abandon their homes is not, not the solution. Um, for example, uh, some of the biggest problems leading to bluff erosion is drain, uh, water draining over the top of the cliffs uh, and eroding and causing the falls. Well, if we need to reshape some of that drainage, so it drains back inland where it can be caught also to go into our groundwater basins. The other is all that ice plant out there that we think is, looks so nice. It's not native and it erodes the cliffs. So over time we need to find a way to remove all of that ice plant so that it doesn't lead to further problems. Um, we might look at, and it's always a, a, a catch 22, but even hardening the base of some of those cliffs. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but I think it's worth a study. It's being done in many places around the country with mixed results, but it's a possibility. Ms. Hartman? Yes. Uh, cliff erosion is an important issue. It is uh, for the bluff top properties, and we've actually had somebody injured running along the beach with a rock that fell. Uh, this has been going on for eons. Uh, bluffs want to be beaches. That's part of the natural process. But it is accelerated by the increased storms and uh, sea level rise. And that is a major issue that we're seeing. The county has developed, uh, we are going to have to step back. And, and managed retreat as the ocean rises. And that's happened already now in Isla Vista. It's been underway for quite some time. There have been six properties that were part of this managed retreat program, uh, and now it's expanded to about twice that. Uh, but we're taking on the landlords rather than taking from them, and that's a very important thing. Uh, these properties, uh, are properties that over time we're gonna have to step back. Uh, in terms of, we've already put in major stormwater improvements in Isla Vista. Our public works department has done that to get the water uh, back, uh, and that happens with our parks and, and our streets and roads and sidewalks. Uh, the issue of um, ice plant, there's already a program underway. I understand somebody was suggesting sunflowers as a way. Uh, that isn't going to do it. Uh, really, the bluffs are steep and there's not a lot of vegetation that can hold it. Hardening, the Coastal Commission will not allow it. It Stop. creates other problems elsewhere. Time. Okay. Our next question will again begin with Ms. Hartman. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Jones. I'm, I apologize. That's okay. No, that's all right. I get overlooked sometimes because I'm not one of the big money candidates, but I do think that my public is paying attention. So. I have a little bit different take than, um, I agree with some of the things that have been said by the other two candidates, but as a native Californian, I grew up witnessing a lot of things from mudslides, houses literally sliding off hills, all kinds of um, damage and storms by beachfront property. And my father was an insurance agent. So we used to talk about these kind of disasters a lot around our, our home. And there was a thing that we all took for granted, and that's if you were in a dangerous area, that kind of came with it. And it was your private property, and you had the responsibility for keeping it safe and for maintaining it. My daughter works for a personal injury attorney as a paralegal, and 
He makes sure that not just property owners, but insurance companies take responsibility if there's negligence. So I always see things through the lens of a private, uh, a native Californian and a private property owner. Yes, our communities have a duty to make sure that we um, properly uh, drain and, and have uh, flood control measures, but it's also important for the private property owner to assume responsibility. So if there was negligence, then there is a system in our government that allows for people to address negligence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question will begin with Ms. Hartman. How should the county deal with the infrastructure maintenance deficit? Uh, the county has, uh, the, it has buildings, it has roads and bridges, and it has parks. And we have base budget for each of those. Uh, in terms of roads and bridges and, and parks uh, and county buildings, we also set aside 18% of our budget, uh, our discretionary budget for that purpose. We also are what's called a self-help county. We passed measure A. And so we are uh, giving tax money to roads throughout our county. And that entitles us to get a lot more money from other entities. We have gotten over $400 million to do some of the work on the Highway 1 one. That project is coming in uh, early and under budget. So that's going to mean we have more Measure A money to go work in North County, uh, something that I'm very supportive of. Uh, so the county is addressing its, its backlog and uh, the problem is, however, that the federal government has not raised uh, its contribution to this effort since the early 90s. And so it's it's a three-legged stool. It's the state, it's the local government, and it's the federal government. These are interstate highways that deal with commerce for all of us. And the federal government, that's why you hear so much talk about infrastructure and an infrastructure bill, because they've been falling down and, and they need to step up. Ms. Jones. Well, I'm going to start where Joan ended just because it, it piqued my curiosity a little bit. On the federal government side of things, I went back two years ago to Washington, D.C. to lobby uh, against something the county was doing that I felt very strongly about. And I was successful in getting into a lot of offices. Um, I know people. And so I, I got access. I got appointments. And I spoke with people and asked them to help us in Santa Barbara County to stop the Camp 4 um, feed a trust thing. And people were nice, but one thing that, that came across loud and clear is people in Washington, D.C. don't care too much about California. They think we're nuts. They think that we are behaving irresponsibly, and so they don't want to get involved. And so, you know, I could hear what they were saying. It hurt my feelings a little bit because I was talking to people that I thought would care a little bit about Reagan Ranch and care about the Santa Inez Valley. It's a very special place. And while I got some, some empathy there, they were like, that place is so far gone. Nobody wants to spend their political capital, so we will let some Republican in North uh, uh, California do something and get away with it because we don't care about you. And uh, so that might be part of the problem with the federal deal. But infrastructure is a way to get votes. It's not sexy. North County, you know, we're... We're not the ones that you're going to spend the money on until it's an election year. You want to do a vin uh, Vintner ordinance or a marijuana ordinance or the stuff that's fun, you know, booze and pot and stuff. Nobody wants to fix a pothole. Time. Mr. Porter. So the, the county is responsible for county facilities and county parks and county roads, not the federal government. So our deferred maintenance, that means the maintenance that, that it, we have not been doing, but if we did it right now, it would cost, according to the county budget, $463 million, half a billion dollars almost. So roads and bridges, over 300 million, parks, 52 million, and county buildings, almost $100 million. And especially with the roads, if you notice, the further north you get, the worse all the roads and the parks get. Once you get up to Guadalupe and look at the county roads up there, uh, in many cases, they've almost totally deteriorated. For our rural areas, the county rates its own roads with a pavement index of 40. That's on the scale of 0 to 100. 
and that means nearly failing and almost impassable. And interestingly, almost 40% of all uh, roads, uh, road maintenance that has not been done is in the third district. So uh, I think over a long period of time, we in the third district have been poorly served. Uh, we're gonna have to find more money to put towards, and, and oh, by the way, that 18% that we're putting towards maintenance um, is not enough to keep up with deterioration. So the $463 million is getting worse and worse and worse. And if we don't do something about it, we'll never be able to, to dig ourselves out of that hole. Thank you. Okay, this question will begin with Ms. Jones. The County of Santa Barbara is ultimate resp ultimately responsible for the foster care system in the county. One half of all resource families will quit within the first year of service. How do you plan to increase the number of resource families while also retaining the families already serving? Well, here goes a really big, big answer, little answer to a big question, actually. There's a deeper problem here, and it has to do with the way that we have been behaving for at least a generation, where instead of encouraging independence, we have encouraged dependency. You know, I could have ended up being part of that foster care system or my son, but I was fortunate enough to have been taught personal responsibility as a young person and to go to a place that, that held me to that. And so it seems like government is growing because it likes to have society dependent on it. And we do a lot of subsidizing of unhealthy behaviors. So I think we really, it's time for a shift in our attitude. So whether it's a foster care system, any kind of welfare system, homelessness, we need to incorporate personal responsibility. Uh, charity is a beautiful thing. Helping a child that doesn't have a home, that can be a very beautiful experience for both the child and the foster parent. But when it turns into something that's like a racket or for money, and it's so complex, we're really getting away from where we should be as human beings and as a, a county that's providing a service. So I would start with a personal philosophy of doing things that encourage people to take responsibility and ownership of their own life. Mr. Porter. I guess I've always considered foster parents as angels. Somebody that would step up and take a child that's not uh, their own and almost always, I'm sure that that child comes with issues caused by whatever led to the foster careness. Um, it's got to be really hard work. There's no doubt about that. My wife is a school nurse in uh, Buellton and Santa Inez, and and she sees cases all the time, um, and they they are truly heartbreaking. I think we need to find ways to incentivize, not necessarily mon monetarily, but recognition in other ways, those families who are willing to step up. Make sure we don't wear them out by sending child after child after child or stack them with multiple children. I think we do need to, to bring in charities to help out, nonprofits, the faith community and others. Uh, I believe if given the mission, they would really be able to step up and help out some of these children. Uh, I, I, I view this as a basic function of county government. Ms. Hartman. Thank you. Uh, because I did work for seven years for CASA with uh, neglected and abused foster children, I do have a, a keen uh, sense of this. I also, or also work uh, as chair of the Kids Network that brings the various nonprofits together. Um, this is an, a particularly important issue because we have had foster children in group homes, and now we are closing those group homes to get the foster children into the, na the resource families. Our last report from social services, we have had a major improvement in getting children placed. Part of it is we're searching harder to get other family members identified. That's the very best if we can get a child with an aunt, an uncle, uh, a grandparent. And so we're, we're looking broadly, not just geographically, to get them with a family member. The other thing is uh, to get, <clears throat> they, they already come with support from private foster placement as well as county, uh, but keeping those workers stable 
so that you don't have every six months a new person coming in. The other thing that's working very well is to create a professional uh, support group across these resource families so that they have uh, can talk to each other and, and talk with others who can help them solve problems and not just leave them isolated. So I'm, I'm happy to say that we have made some real progress even though we have a bigger need because we're closing these group homes. Thank you. Okay, the next question will begin with Mr. Porter. And it deals with the Highway 246 roundabout. The Lompoc community was against the building of this roundabout, but Caltrans would not listen to the community concerns. How can the county supervisors help with this kind of community concern? With my background and degree in civil engineering, that would be one of the, the, the absolute most important things I would do would be an advocate for our communities and our county against Caltrans when they want to do something really stupid. And the roundabout at Highway 246 is an, is an example of that. Um, roundabouts are pretty rare anyway uh, in the state of California. And a roundabout in a rural area out in the middle of a bunch of agriculture fields is even more rare. And to, to put it where they did, in a lot of fog, in a very foggy area, um, just exacerbates the problem, and we killed a firefighter there. We didn't kill him, a firefighter died there, uh, not expecting a roundabout to be in the middle of a bunch of fields in a foggy area. Um, I live right near the roundabout uh, at the intersection of 246 and 154, uh, a road that's heavily trafficked by tourists, especially people who've never been there before. And I've seen people drive the opposite way around the roundabout. I've seen them backing up around the roundabout. There's just certain places you shouldn't put a roundabout, and I think those are two perfect examples. So I would be an advocate for our communities in our county when Caltrans is really trying to do something that, that is irresponsible. Ms. Hartman? Roundabouts have been shown to um, not necessarily reduce collisions, but reduce the harm created by collisions. It's more a side rather than a head-on. And so the question is, where, are, where, where is that happening? Where do you want to uh, have them? We had a situation on Highway 166 with a lot of farm equipment, and, and we uh, backed Caltrans down on that one and said that's not a good place. Uh, and, and despite their studies, and they are engineers, and they come with formulas and, and justification, but they didn't do it there. Uh, the 246 in Lompoc, it needs better lights and better fog, and, and uh, Caltrans is in the process of doing that because we held a forum and we heard from people in Vandenberg Village area that this was a concern, and we brought that back, and Caltrans is, in fact, in the planning process for that. Uh, but I think roundabouts, we're working on that on uh, Highway 154, uh, at the Roblar intersection, at the Edison intersection, and at the Grand intersection. Uh, and those would be very appropriate uh, as a way to slow cars down. And uh, we have a traffic study underway right now, and that's likely to be what's proposed to the community. So we'll be debating this very issue. Ms. Jones. This is a debate. It's a debate in my household. <laughs> my husband likes roundabouts, and he's a very good driver. I, I say, well, they work for you. They don't work for me. I find them confusing as well, but I've gotten a lot better at, at maneuvering my way through the roundabout at 246 and 154, and to give myself a plug, since I'm not gonna be spending a half a million dollars, one of my most beautiful sign displays is right at that roundabout at 246 and 154, and because it is a traffic calming area, people go slow and they can really get a good look. It's beautiful, it's on San Lucas property. But this is a thing, you know, we have to work with Caltrans. Uh, once again, I will say, not only am I the first woman elected to the Community Service District Board in Santa Inez, and we don't need a supervisor mayor, once again. Um, we have latent powers, but one of the things that we do uh, deal with a lot is Caltrans, and the state has uh, authority over where we can lay pipe or, or put in a main line. So we do have to work with Caltrans, and hearing from the public, I'm sure, especially in a, an election year, would make a difference. But this is one of those things that we really haven't settled in my marriage. 
I'm looking over a couple family members now, and I don't even think they're in agreement about these traffic calming devices. They seem a little nanny state and bossy pants to me. But, you know, once I learn and once I get experience with them, then I don't know, especially since I've got my signs there, I think they're pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that concludes the question period of our forum. And each candidate will now have two minutes for a closing statement. Since we began with Ms. Hartman for the opening statements, we will begin with Mr. Porter for the closing statements. Two minutes. Over. Well, once again, thank you to the league. This has been awesome, and I appreciate all your work. I know it's a huge amount of effort to do this. So I believe I have a wide and diverse background that is especially suited to the challenges of being on the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. From my experience on a school board, I understand the many challenges that the families face with their children and preparing them for an uncertain future. From my time on the food bank, I know we have many, many opportunities to better, those, uh, better serve those suffering from food insecurity. From my experience as president of the Santa Barbara County chapter of the American Red Cross, I know how to help this county be more resilient and more responsive when disasters do occur. From my experience as wildland firefighting and responding to oil disasters, I understand the unique challenges to human endurance that's caused by climate change. As an entrepreneur who started my own business from scratch and hired members of the community and brought in interns, I know the challenges of the business community and the many ways the county government can be supportive and not just be in the way. My financial background uniquely prepares me for our county's problems with budgets and unfunded pension liabilities. As a civil engineer, I can provide many insights into ways we can fix the backlog of half a billion dollars of problems with our roads and our bridges and our parks. I look forward to this challenge. Our county has an amazing future, and I certainly would hope to be part of that, and I ask for your vote on March 3rd. Ms. Jones. I also ask for your vote. And I do so as the smallest minority on the planet, an individual. And I'm the only candidate sitting here who is not on a, a government pension. I think employee pensions are a problem, not just because we have this huge unfunded mandate, but also it's a way to buy votes. And there's nobody really sitting at the table for the individual when we negotiate. I would be that person. I'm different in other ways. I stayed home and raised my children after working in psych. I was a stay-at-home mom. I'm a private property rights advocate. I learned a lot from my parents. I mentioned earlier about taking personal responsibility. I also learned how to be optimistic. I know how to find the happy, happy answer. I look for meaning. I try and do my best. I like living in the unincorporated area because I like being free. I don't like being managed a lot. I don't want to live in a city. I don't want to have to deal with all the same rules and all the same um, things that go with that compact lifestyle. I love the third district, and I love its rural character. And I want everybody who is living there to be free from this city, big government, top-down approach to government. And so I would be the diversity that we hear about. Because diversity doesn't have to do with the color of your skin or your sexual orientation. Diversity has to do with ideas, and I am a diverse thinker, and I think that we have a moral obligation to be skeptical and to ask questions and to have a different take, and I think that I would bring that voice. So if you really want to have diversity and if you really respect the rights of minorities, I should be your candidate. And also, you want to have me in the top two because whoever I run against, if I finish in the top two, it will be a contest of ideas, and there will be contrast. It won't be two big government people uh, looking at themselves in the mirror, just a couple of stiffs. I'm the That's person. It. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hartman. Thank you. Um, serving the residents of the 3rd District has really been the greatest privilege of my life. Uh, it, I, I have a PhD. I have a law degree. I've worked for government. I've worked for nonprofits. I've created innovative uh, and even award-winning public-private partnerships. So I'm, I'm not just a, a person in government, and unfortunately, I didn't stay long enough any place to get that pension. Uh, but uh, this job, 
the third district supervisor taps every bit of knowledge that I have. It brings it all to bear. And every day I listen and I learn from people. And that's what makes it really satisfying and exciting. Uh, I, I, on many, many levels, things uh, in the county are on an upward trajectory. I just want to mention briefly pensions. Those will be uh, fully funded by 2030, and we have agreements with our employee unions so that our contributions are going down from the county. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, we have, in my three years, uh, brought that down too. You can't fix everything in three years, but we w are very much on an upward path, and these things are, are getting better. In in terms of my own personal leadership, uh, the Camp 4 Agreement, the, uh, the Gaviota Coast Plan, doubling the size of Halama County Park, opening Barone Ranch for a uh, recreation trail and, and planning now for other recreational activities there, the countywide recreation master plan that's underway, uh, a transition to renewable energy and a whole host of programs there. We have been successful and my office is known as being responsive to people uh, when, when we serve our constituents. I listen, I learn, I take action, I get results. Uh, and it gets noticed. I'm very proud to say that I've been endorsed by four of your five city council members in Goleta, including the mayor who's here tonight. I've been endorsed by the Sierra Club uh, and other environmental organizations. And so uh, I think that speaks highly. Time. Well, again, thank you all for coming. Gracias. Thank you for Television Santa Barbara for the video, to Gary Atkins Sound Systems for the audio, to Transil Pro for translation services, and all the volunteers of the League of Women Voters who helped with this forum. Also, thank you to the candidates for joining us this evening. We appreciate your commitment to serve the community. Thank you to the audience as well for joining us this evening, and we hope that you found this program informative and useful as you prepare to vote. Note that on February 19th, which is a Wednesday, the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara will have a community forum from noon to 2 p.m. at the Santa Barbara Central Library's Faulkner Gallery. The title of this forum is The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters. The speaker, Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, was the first black president of the National League. The forum is free and open to the public and will be followed by an equality to continue the 100th anniversary celebration of women obtaining the right to vote. Finally, please make sure that you are correctly registered to vote and vote. Your vote matters.